running this government today is President Ismet Inulu, who since 1938 has been wrestling with Turkey's manifold difficulties. Inonu is the strong man of his country, though he is assisted by his prime minister and a cabinet. There is also the National Assembly. Of the membership of the Assembly, 85% belong to Inonu's Republican People's Party, which has kept a tight grip on the reins of government since 1924, and was until recently the only party. Seat of government and show window of Turkey is its capital city, Ankara, whose broad avenues and modern buildings rise out of an Anatolian plateau where a quarter of a century ago there stood only a primitive provincial town. Builder of Ankara and father of modern Turkey was Kemal Atatürk, hero of the revolution which followed World War I. In 1922, rousing the Turkish people to patriotic fury, Atatürk drove out the Greek armies, which had occupied part of Turkey with the support of the Allies. Achieving Turkish independence, Kemal Atatürk set out to change a backward oriental despotism into a modern republic. Beginning with his cabinet, he forced his people to adopt the Latin alphabet in place of the complicated Arabic script, and ordered the country modernized and westernized from top to bottom. Strongly uniting his people, Atatürk ruled with a firm hand until he died in 1938. Today, to replace the crypt in which he lies, the government is building a new mausoleum to do him honor. On the leveled off top of one of the highest hills around Ankara, the foundations are being laid for a memorial which will take years to complete and will cost about five million dollars. But despite the splendor of the monument to the founder of modern Turkey, the people living on the hills behind Ankara, the common folk who revere his memory, are little better off for all that he attempted to do. Today, most of Turkey's 19 million people are just about as poorly housed, as badly paid and as shabbily dressed as were their grandfathers. Out of the nation's heavily burdensome taxes, so much goes to support the army but little is left over to provide decent housing or adequate education. Eking out a hand-to-mouth living by selling the produce of his small farm in nearby marketplaces, the average rural Turk is still backward and ignorant by Western standards. Predominantly a farming country whose transportation is primitive and whose industries have been neglected, Turkey depends heavily on one major export crop, tobacco. But the growers can sell to only one customer, the government agent, for tobacco is one of the state's many monopolies. Even factories have been set up by the government because private citizens lack sufficient capital to start important enterprises of their own. Almost 7% of the leaf used in American cigarettes comes from Turkey. And for this, U.S. firms pay over $45 million a year. In addition, Turkish tobacco products sell throughout the world. Thanks to tobacco and to many raw materials needed by both sides during the war, Turkey's exports have exceeded her imports for several years. This favorable balance of export trade has been perhaps the greatest single factor in propping up her shaky financial structure. But little money trickles down to the great masses of the Turkish people. The average income among 80% of the population is seldom more than $50 a year. Of Turkey's 19 million people, more than four-fifths work at the country's primary occupation, farming, which is still conducted in primitive fashion. It is estimated that were it not for the handicap of ancient equipment and methods, Turkish farmers, even allowing for the present labor shortage, could quadruple their production. But the average peasants have to be content with the basic necessities they are able to buy with their small earnings. 
In an effort to improve conditions, farm machinery is being made available in some districts through government-sponsored cooperatives. By means of a system of large rural schools called village institutes, the government is trying to better agricultural production methods and to raise the standards of living and working. Boys and girls are taught both practical and cultural subjects, which they in turn agree to teach in the smaller rural schools back home. In some crafts, such as weaving, old people are brought in as instructors to pass their skills on to the young. There are only 21 village institutes, but their combined influence is widespread. Though the number of primary and secondary schools is still inadequate, Turkey has made notable advances in streamlining its educational system. Elementary schooling in Turkey today is free and compulsory for a period of five years. The 12,000 schools are so crowded that many must operate on a double schedule. Studies include reading, arithmetic, handwriting, history, and geography, with special emphasis placed on civics and the building of well-informed good citizens. Today, an increasing percentage of Turkey's children progress to junior and senior high schools. Many go on to institutions of higher learning, like the University of Ankara. Here, women, teachers, and students are accepted on the same terms as men, in contrast to their lot in the old days when they were kept secluded, veiled, and illiterate. Promising that, as the people were sufficiently educated, they would be entrusted with a greater measure of democracy, the government has granted the right of assembly to an opposition party. Though the minority leaders are kept cautiously within bounds, the government is already finding the members of the new Democrat Party, some of them former colleagues of Ataturk, embarrassingly insistent on airing their grievances and demanding more and more political rights. Turkey's newspapers, always controlled by the government, have begun to speak out with unaccustomed forthrightness. Even friendly editors have gone so far as to criticize the government openly, and some papers have dared to allege government interference in recent elections. But in foreign affairs, Turkish newspapers fully support the government's policies. They report with approval its efforts to cultivate neighboring potentates, whose friendly offices might be useful in case of trouble. Putting on a round of entertainment for Middle Eastern rulers, like the King of Transjordan, Emir Abdullah ibn Hussein, Turkish officialdom and society go all out for lavish oriental hospitality, including the fullest freedom of the banqueting board. Today, Turkey's interests extend far beyond the Middle East. The Turkish people have an active curiosity about the Western world. This activity is arousing an intense interest in the United States among the Turkish people. The U.S. Information Service at Istanbul attracts many young Turks eager to learn about America and things American. And with the visits of U.S. warships to Turkish ports, many Turks who have long admired and emulated Western ways are coming face to face with representatives of the great Republic of the West. Today, in a new meeting of peoples and ideas, Turkey is finding not only aid from the United States and the prospect of continued independence, but also a new breath of freedom and a new will to bring into being the democracy her people have so long been promised.